So I wanted to share with you, like, growing up, I grew up in very, very conservative churches where women didn't really have any sort of leadership role, including even becoming a deacon. And so that was kind of my upbringing. And as my as I moved from denomination to denomination, um, I ended up at a denomination where women can be uh, priests and pastors. And so I've gone through quite an evolution. I was kind of curious about your own path. Were you always in a church where women could be in leadership roles? No. Um, actually, I was uh, raised in a large evangelical denomination, did not ordain women. It was uh, This was before uh, the complementarian discussion has come up in the last 20 years or so. Uh, but over a process of time, uh, toward the end of my senior year in uh, college, I realized that I wasn't that kind of evangelical anymore. I didn't know exactly what kind I was. Uh, I began... This was very early in the discussion of women's ordination. I began reading some of the literature uh, at the time, uh, and I became convinced that theologically there were no problems with women's ordination, but that also was part of my moving. It took me a period of time to move from kind of free church evangelical, as I would describe it. I, I attended a Roman Catholic seminary, got my master's degree there, concluded at the end of that time I wasn't a Roman Catholic. Uh, but it ended up becoming an Episcopalian and uh, was, you know, and, and at that point they were ordaining women. Uh, this was after the new prayer book. So um, I, I've been sort of surprised that there's been a kind of a pushback in Anglican uh, uh, Episcopal circles, although I'm not an Episcopalian now. I'm it's okay to say these things out loud. I'm a member of the Anglican Church of North America. So, yeah, I was sort of surprised. So overall, I would say, yes, my experience has been most of my adult life has been in a church that did ordain women. As part of the whole church wars thing that's been going on uh, here in North America, among Anglicans, Episcopalians, I've been surprised to find that this is being um, fought, this battle is being fought once again. That's sort of a concise, long story. So what was motivating you to not only write a book about this, but actually a systematic theology? Uh, well, I'm a systematic theologian, but it basically came out of just a private conversation. I teach at a place called Trinity School for Ministry. Fellow uh, professor there, a woman who taught pastoral theology uh, named uh, Martha Giltonen, was an ordained uh, Anglican priest, had served in uh, Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts for a number of years and then here in Pittsburgh. And she had uh, been getting a lot of pushback about being a, a woman priest, including among some of the students. She asked me if I would write something. I have a, a blog. And I said, well, yes, but, you know, one, I'm a lay person. Not really my I mean, it is my concern in the sense that I belong to the church, but I'm probably not the best person to be speaking to this. And I'm not a woman, so I wanted her to do it. And she kept pointing out to me, well, I'm my, my area is pastoral theology. I teach, you know, how to do things. You're a systematic theologian. You have background. You have background in both evangelical and Catholic theology. So I said, well, I'll write you some essays. And what happened, I began writing essays and kept going and going. And at a certain point, I realized I had written enough to become a book. And so edited everything, put it together and submitted it to a number of publishers. And uh, a year or so ago, Baylor U University Press decided to publish it. That's awesome. Well, I, I think it's um, it's wonderful. And I think it's super important that men are writing about this because it's important because sometimes the fact that a woman's writing about it, some men will just dismiss it because right. of this whole issue. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and it... Uh, I mean, it is interesting that in terms of the literature that has been written, uh, most of it actually has been written by men. Uh, many people, but the, for example, the biblical commentaries, particularly, uh, you know, most of the really good discussion of the New Testament, um, what the New Testament says about the relationships between men and women is found not in books on or about women's studies or women's ordination, but by biblical scholars. For example, commentaries on 1 Corinthians uh, by Anthony Thistleton, a uh, wonderful book on uh, women by uh, uh, Richard Bauckham. Um, so, but you have to be looking, particularly at, in New Testament studies, where you're you know you're reading a commentary uh, on on First Corinthians, and then you know someone like Anthony Thistleton will have a long discussion of what Paul says about headship. Uh, another well-known New Testament scholar, um, Methodist scholar in this country. Uh, named Ben Witherington III. I don't know if you're familiar with him, mm -hmm. but uh, he teaches at Asbury, very well known. And his doctoral dissertation was on, um, ended up being published as two books. One was on uh, women, Jesus and women, and then the second half of the dissertation was on uh, women in the New Testament. And so it, it's uh, a lot of the material has been written by men, uh, but it is an issue that affects men and women. 
Yeah, I'm glad you're raising those uh, different commentators because, you know, as I, since I mentioned, because of my early upbringing in very, very conservative circles, a lot of my Bible study tools, commentaries definitely leaned towards, you know, men are the head. They are the ones who should be leading churches. And so whenever I would go to, I'm reading, you know, First Timothy or First Corinthians, those passages that talk about headship of the men, especially in like maybe in a church realm, all the commentators, of course, are reaffirming that. Right. And so it's important, I think, to have a diversity of thought on these passages. Yeah. And that's, I mean, one of the interesting things is among, uh, among evangelicals, and by I'm using the word in the broadest sense, particularly I'm talking about American evangelicals, uh, they're familiar with the, the conversation that has been initiated by complementarians, uh, but they're not necessarily so familiar. Um, and I'm 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 actually have been somewhat surprised in some of the conversations I've had uh, when I keep hearing things that were being you know 20 30 years ago the same things being repeated over and over again and it's like have you not read you know current commentaries on First Corinthians um, or do you know the names of Ben Witherington or Anthony Thistleton or um, a guy named Philip Payne who has written a wonderful book on Paul. Um, and there is a kind of just an, an awareness uh, that these issues have been addressed, I think. How do you approach this? Because this could be very complicated when chatting with friends or colleagues that differ from you on this. And they're looking at you going, how could you have that viewpoint? Don't you haven't you read, for, you know, First Timothy? Haven't you looked at Corinthians? How could you even move to that that stance? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I teach at a seminary in a denomination. Uh, where women are ordained, uh, although there are um, sizable, there are movements, groups within the denomination that do not ordain women. Uh, in the ACNA, the American Church, Anglican Church of North America, there are some dioceses that do not ordain women. Uh, what I, we have to do primarily as faculty um, is to engage the conversation with the students. Um, in the church that I attended uh, and still attend for a, a while, the priest uh, did not himself believe in the ordination of women. One of the things I found is helpful is just to sort of have the discussion, find out what the issues are, point things out. Uh, but these personal conversations are often some of the most difficult because, um, uh, yeah, people get excited. Uh, their emotions get raised. Uh, the worst place to have the conversations I found is actually uh, in places like Facebook Social media is uh, notorious for people immediately diving to the bottom and you know, um, sort of embracing the lowest possible level of discourse. Uh, but I, I am spoiled in that I do, you know, being a professor in a seminary, the conversation tends to take place on an academic level. And even when people disagree, we respect one another and we can have the conversation and say, well, yes, OK, but have you considered this? And so it's. Um, it's, I think it's more difficult if you're in a denomination um, that historically doesn't ordain women. So, for example, the church that I uh, was raised in or among, um, half of my book does address the evangelical argument. And there are a lot of folks in those denominations that are having to address this. And it's uh, more difficult for uh, some of them, I think. Can you mention... Um some of the evangelical arguments and how maybe they differ from the Catholic arguments on women ordination. Yeah, that's a crucial issue that um, many people are not aware of this. And uh, I became familiar with it only because I was raised in evangelical, uh, then went did my uh, graduate work at all Roman Catholic places. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when I was doing my doctoral work, this was still very much in the air among Roman Catholics. Um, the Vatican had not yet officially put the put the hammer down or said no more discussion. But the the, the, the Catholic theologians that I knew were uh, intended to be in favor of women's ordination. And in fact, um, I interact with one at great length in my book, uh, whom I studied under at the University of Notre Dame. But the main difference, and again, there's a kind of unawareness of this, is that the Roman Catholic Anglo-Catholic high church arguments against uh, women's ordination are very different from the evangelical or, or, uh, arguments. So the evangelical arguments against women's ordination focus primarily on a few passages in the Apostle Paul, particularly Ephesians uh, chapter 5, when Paul is um, talking about 
uh, relationships between men and women in the family, and he uses the word uh, head to talk about um, the husband, and then uh, a discussion in uh, about head coverings in 1 Corinthians 10, where Paul again uses that word head. Uh, and then the passage in 1 Timothy, where uh, Paul says it was simply one sentence, the translation of which is controversial, uh, but I'll just translate it as, I'm not allowing women to teach uh, and or exercise authority. And so it's really, for evangelicals, uh, it has been these three passages in, uh, uh, in Pauline, uh, the Pauline epistles. Uh, what is found and read uh, from these passages is then read into other parts of the New, Te uh, New Testament, the Old Testament. So for example, um, Genesis 1 and 2, the creation of man and woman, uh, it is that is interpreted to mean that because Adam, the man, was created first, that he has authority over the woman. Uh, and then it's pointed out that Jesus, for example, had male apostles. But it's really the, the, these Pauline passages that are driving the, the exegesis. Uh, in Roman Catholic theology, a major shift took place around the time of Vatican II, uh, which led to a radically different understandings of the relationship between men and women. And the Catholic Church abandoned any notion of the inferiority of women or that there is a hierarchical ordering of women. And in fact, John Paul II, in what's called his theology of the body, has discussions about marriage in which he basically uh, advocated what would be an egalitarian reading of Ephesians 5, saying that the submission in that passage is about mutual submission of husbands and wives to one another. So the Catholic argument is not focused in authority, which is where the Protestant argument is. It is focused in sacramental theology, and particularly the notion that when the priest is celebrating communion, uh, he speaks in what's called in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And this goes back to a uh, discussion in Thomas Aquinas, uh, when Aquinas is talking about uh, what is essential for this celebration of a sacrament, and Aquinas, using Aristotelian language, uses two different, uh, a distinction between what's called form and matter, uh, he says the form of the sacrament is the words. So in baptism, the form of the sacrament is I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The matter of the sacrament is the water. So if you have the form, the words, and the water, and the intention of the person baptizing the priest to do this in the name of the church, the baptism is valid. Aquinas then looks at the Eucharist and says, well, what is the form? What are the words? He says the words are the words of institution. Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. And the matter is uh, the bread and wine. And so when the priest says those words, he is speaking Aquinas' expression in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And that's what you need for a valid sacrament. And that's all Aquinas says about it. It's just sort of like, and then he goes on to talk about other things. Uh, but what has happened in the modern period is that that notion of in persona Christi was interpreted uh, in an encyclical that was endorsed by Pope Paul VI called Inter Insignioris to mean that because the priest speaks in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, that the priest must physically resemble Christ, uh, and therefore the priest must be a man. So th that's where the difference is between the two positions. One is focusing on um, liturgy, sacraments, and what is the priest or the pastor doing? Um, and, and that's also the Lutheran theology, uh, that the pastor is speaking in the person of Christ. The evangelical focus is on authority and not especially in churches that are very sacramentally low church, they're not particularly concerned about you know, sacramental theology in that way. That's a really fascinating um, way that those two different approaches are taken to this issue. I never even heard the, the Roman Catholic viewpoint you just expressed. That's very fascinating, the, um, the sacramental theological approach. Right, yeah, and that's, um, and again, for I think it's interesting that, that Protestants and Catholics uh, who are opposed to the ordination of women, recognize, well, there are some Protestants who are opposed to the ordination of women, uh, evangelicals realize Catholics, but they don't understand or re recognize that they're for very different reasons. So I've, I've had discussions with evangelicals uh, in my own church. Often there's a distinction between high church and low church, evangelical Anglicans or Anglo-Catholic Anglicans. Uh, and I've had evangelical Anglicans uh, try to disagree with me about the Catholic position. And I said, well, you know, I studied at Roman Catholic seminary. I know the position. Uh, Roman Catholics don't mind, for example, having women theologians teaching in seminaries. Evangelicals, at least presumably, who don't believe in the ordination of women, at least if they're following people like uh, Wayne Grudem, uh, 
the man who's written the most material in this area, uh, does not believe that women are allowed to teach in seminaries. Hmm. Um, although there are evangelical, many evangelical seminaries, places like Wheaton, where women do teach. Um, but I think Wheaton generally, you know, people, places like Wheaton would be more open to the ordination of women. So, yeah, so those are the major differences. And I wasn't aware that some of the conservative circles um, wouldn't even allow women to teach in seminaries. That seems like uh, even a bigger stretch because it yeah. seems like for me, the Pauline argument was like in churches specifically. Yeah. Well, um, and again, I can't speak. I'm not a member of one of those denominations, but uh, if you, Wayne Grudem himself, and he's a, the chief spokesman, he lays out things that women are and are not allowed to do. Uh, specifically, they they can teach children, uh, teenagers. Uh, he suggests that they could actually teach at a secular college or university, uh, but he specifically says that they should not be teaching in seminaries. Um, and again, that has to do with uh, the issue of authority to teach. For a woman theologian to teach a male student uh, would be presumably exercising authority in some sense over that student. There may be exceptions. Um, these are not my denominations, and mm -hmm. so I'm not sure how. Um, for, I mean, the, the one denomination that I would be aware of, Southern Baptists, for example, still do not ordain women. Uh, I'd be curious as to whether that would imply that uh, women could not teach at a place like uh, you know, Southern Baptist Seminary or OPC, Orthodox Presbyterians, uh, West, Westminster Seminary. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll have to wait to hear if I hear from those people to find out. I mean, do they actually ag agree with Grudem on this? I, I don't know from experience. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if anything, Grudem's trying to be consistent. I mean, he's really taking that to the literal extent of men, sh women should not be teaching over a man. And that means like in every single case. So he's just trying to be consistent with that reading. I'm curious, like, how do you like because those passages, especially the the Protestant viewpoint of headship, where Paul draws a lot from Genesis 2 and Eve being responsible for sinning and how do you approach that argument in your in your book? Well, uh, <laughs> this is covering a lot of territory. Uh, basically, I'm just drawing on uh, the discussions that have been taking place in terms of exegesis uh, among uh, competent contemporary theologians. So uh, I would say the two crucial passages are, in fact, the Ephesians 5 passage uh, and the 1 Corinthians 10 passage. Uh, in both of those cases, the entire argument has largely, or the main argument has hinged on uh, the actual use of the word head, which is interpreted to mean authority. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, there's been this big discussion of this issue in the last 10 or 15 years where scholars have actually looked at what's going on uh, in contemporary first century culture and how is the metaphor, uh, the Greek word is kephale, how has that been interpreted in Greek culture? And one of the things that's interesting, we assume head just simply means authority. That's how it's used as a metaphor, and it is a metaphor, uh, in contemporary English. But it appears to be the case that that was not what was going on in the first century. Again, this gets into all kinds of discussion about comparing various texts. Grudem argues that the word head, kephale, always means authority in um, Greek culture. However, those who've studied it carefully and, and have done the parallel show, well, no, it doesn't tend to mean that. Scholars tend to argue it means source, topmost, foremost. Literally, that's what the word means. Um, the examples that Grudem uh, gives are uh, examples of military command, of, of a commander, a general, for example, being the head of an army. Uh, but the context of marriage is different. Paul is doing something unique. Paul is the first person ever uh, in history to use the word head to talk about how, what is the relationship between a man and a woman in a marriage. And so to find out what Paul means, you have to look at the context. How is he using the term? And when he's actually using the term, uh, he doesn't use, he doesn't attach authority to it. So in Ephesians, he connects it with nurturing. Uh, the husband is ahead insofar as he nourishes the wife. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, when he's talking about the whole issue of um, head covering, the, the focus on that passage, if you look at the first half of the passage and the second half of the passage, has to do with the different ways in which people are sources of one another. So in the first part of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about 
um, the fact that uh, the woman comes from the man, looking back on that Ephesians passage, but then he turns around in the second pass, half of the passage and says, but in the same way, all men now are born through or come through women. And again, I would refer to the people. I mean, there's lots and lots of this discussion. I don't want to get, I don't want to go off into too many details. I would I particularly recommend a very helpful man, uh, Philip Payne, has written a lot about this in a, a book on Paul. Uh, but also Anthony Thistleton. Um, it's, it's a discussion that's going on for, for a while. I'm, I'm just one voice. So that, that head, con, uh, head discussion is certainly part of it. Uh, the other thing is that when you actually look at what are going on, in, what's going on in the passages, they're not talking about uh, authority of one person over another. So the passage where Paul in Ephesians talks about men, about submission is m generally mistranslated in uh, English translations. It's translated, translated as an imperative, uh, wives submit to your husband, but there is no actual verb in that. Uh, verse, what happens is it's a long, one of Paul's typical really long passages where Paul begins by saying that uh, Christians should be doing various things. They should be singing in Psalms. They should be pr praying. Uh, and then he says in a participle, submitting to one another, wives to their husbands. Uh, but what's really clear is that the submission that Paul is talking about in this passage is a mutual submission of all Christians to one another. Then what he talks about in the rest of the passage is he shows how wives, in the same way that all submit, submit to their husbands, husbands in the same way that all follow Christ's love, love their wives. But it's really clear that everybody in the passage is being simply asked to do what they're already doing. Um, and so he's not specifically saying only wives submit. Uh, he's talking about the manner in which uh, this is done. And again, I, I'd refer people to the literature on that. Oh, and I and also say, again, yeah, and I already mentioned the First Corinthians passage the focus is Paul is balancing the fact that women, um, that, that Eve came from Adam, saying uh, men uh, now come from women. Uh, the only time, which is really interesting, the only time that the word authority, exousia, exousia, is used in that passage, is in the passage where Paul says that a woman to have authority over her head. The um, translations like the English Standard Version translate that a woman should have a symbol of authority over her head. There is no word symbol of in the Greek. What the Greek literally says is that the woman should have authority, that is, her own authority over her head. Uh, what that means, uh, scholars disagree about. Most of the mean it implies that the woman has the authority to speak, uh, but that she should do so in a manner that recognizes um, the gender distinctions of the culture by wearing a veil or um, or perhaps a particular hairstyle. Uh, but again, I would rec uh, one of the things I do in, in my book is I try to look at the uh, numerous ways in which the passage has been interpreted by numerous scholars and bring them all in. So it's not just simply a matter of this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. It's, well, here's what the complementarians say, but here are what other scholars say. The complementarian position is just one among many, uh, and here's the reason why it's problematic. Yeah, well, I like how you're kind of bringing in different voices because um, there are so many different perspectives on these passages, and especially like the head coverings one, because I've heard that passage being used in very, very conservative circles around why women should be wearing like veils over their heads because Paul is kind of alluding to that. Yeah, um, if that's what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, the problem is, is it, it's difficult to interpret uh, the Greek there, and and I, 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 I'm a systematic theologian. I'm dependent on biblical scholars here, uh, but it it either means hair I think down over or something. Like, I don't want to do the actual, but anyway, it can be. Some scholars say, well, what he's, he's clearly talking about is, is a manner of wearing the head hair. Um, so some scholars have interpreted this to mean that they should have their hair tied up on top of their head, you know, and I guess I would say a a, a bun. Um, and not just simply down loose. Uh, other scholars saying no, he's talking about head covering. But what's really clear, if you know, is that the the issue of controversy has to do with what would have been a gender marker in first century culture. Um, so for when, when people say, well, because Paul says that women should wear head coverings, that women should do that today. Wearing a head covering does not have the same social connotations in 21st century culture that it might have had in first century Corinth. So it's, uh, 
if a, if a symbol is not communicating uh, what is intended to communicate, then it's sort of an empty symbol. You know, it would be if you know here here in the U.S. if you see a you know a, you know if you're driving down the road and you see a sign um, it says "Do not enter" and you're on the right side and, and you know coming in on the left side of the road, well, that's probably not a good thing. However, if you're in England, you're not going to see a sign that says "Do not enter" if you're on the left side of the road because these are just culturally different things. So the um, and it's interesting that even most complementarians don't say women should wear head coverings, but they do um, say that uh, the head covering is a symbol of male authority, and therefore women, whether they wear head coverings or not, should recognize that the men are in charge. Um, but that doesn't seem to be what the passage is about, or at least most most scholars today, uh, outside of complementarian circles, would would not say that. As as you um, chat with uh, various women. Um, pastors and priests, I'm curious about like some of the challenges that they're having and and also like your recommendations for those of us who are in congregations and want to do a better job supporting um, the women leaders in the church. Yeah. Uh, well, the problem is, is twofold. Um, one is that there are denominations and even within even uh, denominations, evangelical or otherwise, uh, that ordain women. Uh, there is still uh, very much a, a kind of can be a hostility to ordain women. Uh, and the other difficulty is just simply the, um, you know, finding a, a congregations that are willing to hire women as a priest or a, a pastor. I think that, that folks who've been doing that longer uh, are more open to it. So, for example, I think, you know, denominations like, you know, the Lutherans, Methodists, uh, those folks have been doing it for so long. Or, uh, even, when, even even among evangelicals, for example, there are denominations like Wesleyan Methodists who've been ordaining women for um, since the time of the Civil War. Uh, but among denominations for which this is a fairly recent thing, um, there's still a lot of opposition, and uh, and then there's just always you know the problem of uh, of finding a position in a church. Uh, most congregations are still tend to want to hire a man. Uh, there may be congregations that say, well, we don't theologically have problems with it, but, you know, if, if there are two people being interviewed, often um, the man will be the, the preferred person that's going to be hired. So um, I, 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 I do talk to uh, women at seminary pre predominantly who have a, often have a frustration with, well, well, if I get my degree, will I be able to find a, a position? Uh, but I'm, I'm I am pleased to say that more and more uh, of our or, uh, students who go off uh, graduate, get ordained, and are uh, able to, to find positions. So it's a, it's I think it's a cultural change that's going on. The culture as a whole has seen a shift since the time that I was uh, a young person, where you know it was rare for women to work outside of the home. To where now uh, most families are two income families, and I think that that gra that shift is gradually taking place in the church as well. Uh, certainly, women have positions of leadership in churches that they wouldn't have had 20, 30 years ago, even if they're not ordained. So for example, boards of vestries and Anglican churches or presbyteries and pre Presbyterian churches, uh, what are called boards of deacons in congregational churches. Deacon is, has a different structure in those churches than it does in Anglican or Episcopal churches, uh, would, would tend to have more women in positions of leadership. Women also are, are participating more and more in worship activities and teaching and those kinds of things within churches. Um, I think the one thing that is where there's still, and, and again, I can't speak for complementarian uh, churches, but I think even among churches where there are not often women pastors, there are much more willingness to allow women to do things like teach Bible studies, uh, to participate in worship in various ways. And, I, and again, I have, I have not been, I've not been in a low church evangelical setting uh, since I was a very young man. So I'm, I'm not sure what always goes on in those settings, but I do know among more mainline, historically mainline denominations, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, Anglicans, Lutherans, uh, women tend to have much more of a, much more freedom than they do in the traditionally low church evangelical, some kinds of charismatics, very, very conservative Presbyterians. Yeah. I also think about it's hard when young girls like going to a church or, or, their exposure is that they don't see women in those leadership roles. So they don't think that's even like a possibility for them. Right. Yeah, I think that's true. Your book also addresses some of the um, traditional arguments on women ordination. I was kind of curious, like the historical or traditional approach um, that you take or 
positions that are out there? Well, th that's one of those interesting things that when you actually look at the tradition, um, you find that there's a, a good deal of amnesia, as I, I put it in the book. Somewhere around the mid 20th century, around the 1950s and 60s, uh, as the culture began shifting, there was a theological shift in all the denominations as well. Um, and, the, and the denominations that don't ordain women, Roman Catholic complementarians, insist emphatically, we do not in any way, shape or form question the equality of women or the mutual intelligence of women. We just believe on theological grounds that God does not call women uh, to this position. And one of the reasons why we point that out is that it's never happened historically. The tra tradition of the church has said no. Uh, but, but what's interesting is that when you actually look at the history of the tradition uh, and find out why is it that the church did not ordain women, you find from the very beginning that the only word to use to describe it is that there's a kind of a sexist bias. Uh, and specifically, there are three things that are said about women. Women uh, are said to be less intelligent than men. Uh, they're overly emotional and they're overly subject to, to temptation and particularly sexual temptation. And th these are grounds uh, when you read the church fathers and when you read medieval theologians, grounds not simply to not ordain women, but to not allow them to have any positions of leadership whatsoever. So the traditional argument against the ordination of women is not, well, women can do anything except for they can't be ordained. The argument was women shouldn't be doing anything that would involve any kind of position of leadership. Um, John Chrysostom actually, I mean, he has this discussion where he says that God created men to be smarter and to run things, and he created women. They're they're good at managing households, but they should just stick there. And those are the, the traditional historical divisions in pre-modern industrial culture. I mean, in cultures where most work was done using animal labor, the kinds of things that we think, and, and there was no machinery. Women tended to be confined to the home. You, uh, in in, in pre-industrial cultures, large families are necessary. But if you're confined to the home, you, you don't tend to be educated. Uh, women in traditional cultures, were, most people were not educated in traditional cultures. A, a small handful would have been literate. But anyway, for that reason, the traditional argument that you will find among the church fathers, both East and West, uh, in the medieval period, T Thomas Aquinas uh, is actually fairly broad minded about these things. But he also says that he says the main reason women can't be ordained is because men have a greater power of rationality. He talks about that. And Richard Hooker in, in uh, the Church of England and his laws of ecclesiastical polity uh, when he talks about marriage, he says that women always needed to be guided by women, which is, and so for example, when in the marriage ceremony, the reason why the f husband, uh, or sorry, where the father of the bride gives the bride away, it's because the imbecility, that's the actual word that he uses, the imbecility of women shows that women have to always be guided by others. Um, so that's the historical argument. And uh, you don't find that argument being used by those opposed to women's ordination these days. And I think that's good. Um, but I think at the same time, if you're simply going to appeal to the tradition, uh, you need to be honest enough to recognize, well, the tradition, yes, the tradition did look at scripture, but it provided a theological reason for what they interpreted scripture to be saying, which was that, you know, women just are not mentally capable of, of leading. Um, and that's not the argument that would be used today. Man, like hearing that, and then also just thinking about some of the passages and that that Paul wrote about women being silent and needing to be uh, submitting to their husbands, like all of that, with especially the historical arguments. If I was a woman, I would just be very hesitant to want to be part of a church that taught that way, because of those, like that's horrific, like that type of thinking, uh, that women aren't uh, smart enough, not logical enough, too emotional. Like those are terrible reasons. Like as as you're like sharing kind of this traditional viewpoint. And as you chat with um, women pastors and priests, what I mean, what do they say about these like terrible historical arguments? Um, well, they're not fond of them, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think for the most part that the, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't think that well, I, I need, one needs to be careful here. I think among uh, feminist theologians, the movement of feminist theology uh, in the church um, since the 1980s have done research in this area and are familiar with. Uh, this material. Uh, I think sometimes that has been unfortunate among certain kinds of feminist theologians that they've simply presumed that the church is oppressive to women. But um, yeah, I mean, when women discover this, it doesn't make, you know, it certainly doesn't make them happy. It um, it, it can sort of, you know, fulfill certain suspicions and stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think it's fortunate that that, that is not 
the argument that's being used today, uh, even among complementarians. Uh, but I do think that it needs to be pointed out that, okay, um, if that's not your argument, then you need a theological argument more than just simply, well, men are in charge. Without it. Well, well, why should men be in charge uh, if women are not somehow less intelligent than men? Uh, I, I think it, is, it also is the case, and, and this keeps coming out more and more, that whatever people say publicly, you do find out that behind closed doors, there's still a lot of sexism in the church and a lot of uh, abuse in the church. There, there was a case a, a few weeks ago uh, a couple of months ago in a Facebook group run by some conservative Presbyterians. Um, you may have heard about this, that, it, um, that, it, uh, that a woman in, in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church had just written a book, uh, not about women's ordination, but questioning some of the you know, aspects of complementarianism. And apparently within this group that there was all kinds of um, sexist comments about women Mm. Um, they should be, you know, bare, the whole kind of barefoot pregnant kind of arguments. Uh, and Christianity Today ran an article about this a few months ago. Uh, and then, of course, um, the church is not exempt. But, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, there was a lot of controversy about sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church. Most of this having to do with male priests and uh, younger boys. Not, not anyway. It, in the recent, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, it's now coming out that this is not exclusive to Roman Catholics and uh, uh, and it's not exclusive to male on male uh, sexual abuse. That there's a uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot going on uh, with, with clergy in particular who take advantage of their power uh, to take advantage of women. Um, don't want to get into details, but there's a case of a well-known evangelical apologist um, who died recently and uh, came out just recently that he's, you know, had been engaged in some uh, somewhat appropriate behavior. Um, Well-known uh, head of a major uh, evangelical university college, this has been all over, that was dismissed from his position recently for, so um, yeah, it, it is an ongoing problem and uh, Christians are certainly not exempt from it. I'm just wondering, like, what what can we do to help to mentor up and raise up this next generation of women leaders? Like, how do we do a better job of supporting young women and and the current women in leadership roles so that we have a better um, a better church with more women leaders and and men supporting women and 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 I'm just wondering, like, practically, what what are some things we can do as members of, members of congregations? Well, wow, yeah. So you're asking a systematic theologian to do pastor. <laughs> I, I do think that one of the things that's needed um, in the conservative, um, by conservative I mean theologically conservative uh, community, uh, is just more discussion, more open discussion about uh, marriage and sexuality and about relationships between men and women. Uh, and family beyond just simply focusing on um, the thou shalt nots. I mean, I, I have to confess that in my own, you know, I very seldom have heard discussions of uh, family or relation. There's, there's certain topics that just don't dis get discussed uh, from the pulpit or in the church because uh, I think they're controversial. And so um, economics, politics, uh, relationships between men and women, race. These are sort of things that I, I think there's a kind of understanding that, well, if you you should be able to figure things out from the implications of what is being preached. But And it is the case that when these things uh, are discussed, it can, you know, even uh, um, among folks that you wouldn't think that, that there can be, le leads to high emotions of controversy. So, um, so, so flipping to another topic, I mean, right now, the whole culture right now is having a discussion of race. And uh, particularly issues of uh, institutional racism and are there such things as white privilege? Um, a man in my church named Isa McCulley, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Esau's uh, recently published a book called uh, Reading While Black, uh, which uh, I've been reading lately. I think it's a really good book. But I, I, as, I, I, as I was reading, I thought, oh, man, I wish this book had been published before I could have had written my book because I think that there are some issues of overlap. Uh, between race and gender. Uh, but I've been very surprised at some of the responses uh, to his book uh, that I've seen, uh, again, in the social media settings where he's 
accused of being, uh, the word that is used is woke, defensive arguments that, well, the church is not racist. The church doesn't discriminate. I, well, maybe not consciously, but it is, it's been true forever that um, Sunday morning is the most, uh, one place that is still most segregated in American culture. Uh, and, and that is again true. You know, my seminary where I teach, we have a lot of African students. Um, we don't have very many African American students. Um, so you, you, you know, if you walk into my church, I mean, into my seminary, you find a black student and you talk to him or her, uh, there's a much higher chance that they're from Kenya or Uganda than they are from, um, from downtown Pittsburgh where the seminary is located. So I, I think all of these things are things that we need to be discussing and, and trying to do what we can uh, about. But I think it's, I think it's something that uh, it's going to, I think, take generations before the church really has gotten past some of the cultural baggage that we've been holding on to. And I, and I recently read um, Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited, where he talks about some of the trauma that the Bible has caused, specifically Paul's right, getting back to Paul, mm -hmm. um, slaves obey your masters and propagating the idea that slavery is okay um, in the New Testament and how harmful and hurtful that was to our black community especially during the early American church as pastors were advocating that slavery was okay. That was being preached from the pulpit. Like it was no wonder why, like if I was black, like I would have nothing, I would want to have nothing to do with the church. But then at the same time, the Bible was also used to support the liberation and Martin Luther King relied on the, uh, the Bible. And so you have like the Bible is such a complex book because you have these passages that are, providing support, encouragement, comfort. At the same time, you have these passages that can be very harmful. And like you're saying, like it relates to not only women, but also um, the racism that's in America with uh, Paul advocating slavery. I would push back against saying Paul advocating slavery. I don't think Paul was advocating slavery. Uh, one of the really helpful uh, things I talk about in my book is the notion of what I call Christological subversion. Uh, what I call Christological subversion is a way that the Bible, New Testament, takes traditional notions that have been understood to be a certain way in, in the culture and kind of turns them upside down. So um, one of the things I, I talk about, again, relying on uh, a particular man named David De Silva. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a New Testament scholar. But he, uh, he has written a lot about uh, Mediterranean culture being a, an honor culture. Uh, and in an honor culture, uh, there's always a hierarchy. Uh, males are at the top and, and various folks are lower down in the chain. Women are lower than men. Slaves are lowest of all. And one of the things that De Silva talks about in his book is the way that the New Testament subverts this honor culture. So the ways in which honor uh, is established in Mediterranean culture are challenged. So the father in Mediterranean culture, and this includes both Jews and uh, pagans, has absolute authority. But the notion of father in the New Testament is a father is a father of Jesus. And this father is a father who does things like the father of the prodigal son, who follows out after, who runs out after the runaway, after the sinner and brings them back. Uh, Jesus reaches out to people who are uh, on the edges of society and culture, including, uh, uh, for example, the woman at the well who has uh, been married five times, living with Anne and not her husband. Uh, she becomes the first witness um, the, to in the New Testament, the first evangelist in the New Testament. Paul, uh, again, in, in Ephesians, really helpful here to read how he's actually challenging what are called the traditional ways in which uh, people like Aristotle deal with the family, what are called the household codes, where Aristotle addresses commands to the, the husband only and says, you're in charge, the wife is next, then are the children, then are the slaves, and your job is basically to tell all these people what to do. What Paul does in Ephesians is he addresses the people who normally would have been in positions of submission in a Mediterranean culture, and he actually gives them a place of, of dignity. So he says, uh, he challenges both the, the, the male, so he says to the slave owner, uh, you, are, you, you are a slave of Christ. Uh, he says to those who are in, would be in traditional positions of submission, that A, we're all to submit to one another, but they have a place of, um, he doesn't simply focus on top-down authority, but showing how there's a mutual 
relationship between everyone and that all are to follow in Christ. And then, of course, the crucial passage for Paul is Philemon, where he returns the slave Philemon uh, to his master. And he says, I'm not exactly going to tell you what to do, but I would ask you to treat Philemon the same way you treat me. Um, and the fact that that was preserved and was made canonical uh, presumably means that the master uh, freed Philemon. Uh, but it is a case, uh, and again, I would point to this uh, really helpful book by De Silva on honor culture, uh, that the way the New Testament deals with um, things like slavery uh, and honor in the contemporary culture is not simply to try to overthrow these things because it wouldn't have happened, uh, but to try to find ways to um, create more freedom uh, and to challenge them from within. A couple of books I mentioned in my book that deal with these issues. A really helpful book by, you know, the names are slipping me, uh, Alan Paget. He has a really helpful book on authority in the New Testament called As Christ Submits to the Church. Uh, and then there's a, um, yeah, anyway, several books that I talk about, but uh, one of the things that's been going on a lot in contemporary New Testament and Old Testament scholarship is showing how it is that the New Testament actually challenges um, New Testament culture, I mean, not New Testament culture, but Mediterranean culture, and gives a different vision. So, but that's also why hermeneutics is important. We can't simply put ourselves back in first century culture and say nothing has changed. And now we're going to pretend like we live in uh, ancient Corinth or ancient Rome um, and, and, and ignore the way in which um, over the last 2000 years, Christianity itself has contributed to recognizing uh, more and more freedom and equality. So one of the things I do argue about um, in my book, I have a chapter at the beginning where I talk about this shift that took place uh, in terms of understanding what Christian freedom means, beginning with from Luther and moving on. So when Luther talked about the freedom of a Christian, he was appalled at what was called uh, been called the Peasants' Revolt. It said, "No, no, no, you misunderstood. Justification by faith doesn't mean that uh, that serfs get to quit being serfs." But then a couple of generations later, you have John Wesley who is arguing against slavery um, based on the whole, on the same New Testament passages. He's drawing implications from Paul's understanding that Luther himself did not draw. And then of course, in the 19th century, uh, there were various Christians involved in the anti-slavery movement, people like William Wilberforce um, in parliament, uh, the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionists here in uh, the United States. And then, um, I think you certainly can make an argument and has been made, should be made that the civil rights movement in the 1960s was drawing on, um, drawing on themes coming out of the scriptures. I mean, it's not a coincidence that people, that the leaders of the civil rights movement were people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, various Roman Catholic clergy. Um, so yeah, there have been people and including people in the history of the church who've argued for, things like slavery based on, you know, a single passage in Paul here or there. But I think that's really a misreading of what's going on in the New Testament. Uh, and I would say that as well about, you know, uh, women in the New Testament. The New Testament um, as a whole is, I, I think, very liberating toward women. And one of the things I actually do argue toward the end of my book is that there are indications that women had, uh, did serve some kind of positions of office in the New Testament church. Yeah, and I think that that speaks to just how complicated the Bible can be because there are so many different uh, perspectives on these different passages, especially these complicated ones. And um, so I'm really grateful for your book to shed light on these different perspectives when it comes to women's ordination, how these passages talking about women can be read differently. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Uh, before we go, um, one of the, the sections you deal with is called the argument from symbolism. I was wondering if maybe you can just kind of give us a little bit of insight on what that is. Wow. Um, yeah, that's that actually has been more of a Catholic argument. Uh, it does appear in people like C.S. Lewis. Uh, but this is an argument that says that uh, there are culturally transcendent differences between men and women. Um, well, it also, again, part of it has to do, with, again, with the argument that Jesus is a male figure uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the God of the Old Testament. There are no goddesses. There is a uh, Yahweh is a male God. Uh, the apostles were male. But then that also is it, uh, picks up on um, that there are historic, that there are these differences between men are naturally transcendent is the way the word. And women tend to be more imminent 
Uh, I, I think that the New Testament argument is more helpful. I mean, the, the question is, why is it that the God of the Old Testament is a real God? Um, it's a really helpful the woman I draw on, a Jewish woman named Tikva Reimer Kinsky, has a helpful book called uh, uh, Dealing with Goddesses in Ancient Culture. And the title slips me my mind. But uh, one of the things that she points out in that book is that first, uh, the God of the Old Testament is not a male God in the sense of uh, sexually male. For example, God is never described below the waist. He doesn't have a consort or a bride. Um, he's male in the sense of there's one God for Israel. So it is monotheism that makes Israel distinct. One of the really interesting things that happens in Israel is that because there is no goddess, that the nation of Israel takes the place of the goddesses in pagan religion. So uh, Israel becomes the bride. Uh, and this actually elevates women and it elevates uh, human beings. Uh, and the same thing takes place in the New Testament. The church is the bride of Christ. So, yeah, I, I do think it's important to, to recognize that the God of the Old Testament is not sexually a male God. That's a, that's a misunderstanding. There are reasons why, and I, I talk about these in, in my book, about why why did Jesus choose 12 apostles um, who were male? And that basically has to do with the topology of the, the Old Testament, that uh, Israel was indeed a patriarchal culture. Uh, Israel traces its heritage back to the 12 uh, male sons of Jacob. There are 12 tribes because there are 12 sons. There are 12 apostles who represent the, the church as the new Israel. Uh, if there had been 13 apostles, it would not have worked. Uh, if there had been, uh, if Jesus had called women apostles, again, it would not have fulfilled the, uh, the symbolism. But Jesus did call women to be his disciples, uh, who, except for the 12, seemed to be doing everything that, that his male followers were doing. That, that sort of. Uh, and then for the, the arguments about male transcendence and female eminence, I just find that to be a little bit bizarre that people are using arguments like that these days. Um, I, I would, uh, what, I, what I say in my book is this is an example of what I call natural theology in a bad sense. That is where you're taking a notion of symbolism from outside of scripture and imposing it on scripture. So, uh, the people who talk that way tend to look toward things like Jungian psychology, uh, the imagery in pagan religions, you know, um, uh, sun gods, uh, moon goddesses. And my own, my, my reading of that says that is just simply not the way you read scripture. You don't, you don't look to ancient, you know, to, to Hinduism or ancient Greek religions or, um, or do Jungian psychology and then say, let's read the New Testament in light of that. Rather, the New Testament should be challenging that kind of reading. Um, and it is interesting. And, and again, I mentioned Tikva, uh, Frimer Kinsky, this Jewish woman. Uh, she points out that scripture does not treat women as somehow inherently different from, uh, from men, uh, women in the Old Testament have they they live the kind of do the kind of things that women would have done in uh, ancient culture. They're primarily mothers, uh, but they're not somehow viewed as being a different kind of person. As if you know, uh, women are less rational, um, women are more subject to temptation. They're portrayed the same way that men are portrayed. Um, so I think that these, you know, th these kinds of books, I think, can be really helpful. People who actually look back on what's going on. Um, and I, I think that the people who are. If I, if I use uh, example, if I use the conservative reading, I'm talking about culturally conservative. I think people who are culturally progressive can actually make the same mistake of reading things from our culture back into uh, first century or ancient cultures. Uh, and then either embracing that or. Uh, or being appalled by it rather than saying, saying, you know, how does what's going on in the New Testament speak to the issues of the first century culture? And then how might those in a very different culture, how might those same, um, same theology, the same theology you find in the New Testament, uh, speak to our culture, uh, without in any way denying or questioning the authority of the, of the scriptures, which I don't think are primarily sexist or, or don't primarily teach a hierarchical understanding of the relationships between men and women. Uh, and certainly do not advocate um, uh, some kind of slavery based on race. Um, that is a that reading of the New Testament um, by some people, particularly in this country, in the South, uh, in the 19th century uh, during the Civil War was simply a radical misreading, I think. Yeah, and I think you just raised some just really good questions that we should be asking ourselves as we're reading the Bible. So thank you so much for your your latest book. Um, I'm excited to to write about it.
grateful for everything you've shared today. Thank you so much, Dr. Witt. Well, thank you.